Hey, Anna. Thanks so Hi. much for joining us for the interview today. So we're from AMAX and I'm Daniel. And then this is Husni, Husni over here. Hey, Anna. And so this interview is for the first year CMS students starting this fall to learn more about their first year professors and courses since everything is online. There's less of an opportunity to do that. But we have, so we have our list of courses, our list of questions here. But before that, we'd like you to introduce yourself. All right, sure. Hi, my name's Anna Brecher. And um, in first year, I teach CSC or MAT A67, which is a introductory discrete math course and kind of lays the foundation for future theory courses in both computer science and in math. So I'm really looking forward to seeing a bunch of new faces this year. And um, I guess we'll be seeing you all September 8th or 10th. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I guess one thing to ask before we start, like uh, how was your summer and what have you been doing through quarantine? Yeah, so my summer's been pretty uh, low key. Um, <laughs> aside from getting a bit of work done, I've uh, been chasing my kids around and um, pretty much just staying home and around the neighborhood. So uh -huh. it's been pretty, pretty easy going. Yeah, no big, I think, I think no big, for, big yeah, for 95% for of us, that's uh, what's been going on as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh huh. Okay, so right, let's get started with the first question. So I'll begin it. So the first question we have for you is, uh, a lot of students, I think, when they go into A67, they really question why they're learning this course, because, you know, they might want to get into the CS program, but uh, this course and so many others in first year are so math related. So, right. you know, why are we doing so much more math than CS in first year? Um, okay, well, there's a few reasons for it. Um, a lot of the really cool computer science areas are actually very much dependent on a strong foundation in math. So, for example, say you're interested in computer graphics and gaming, a lot of that comes down to uh, calculus, probability. Um, there's a lot of mathematics behind everything you see in, in a computer game, let's say, or in graphics. Um, and then other cool areas like artificial, artificial intelligence, um, you know, it's very much dependent on logic and probability. And those are both things that we touch base on um, in CSEA 67 or MATA 67. And we just really scrape the surface. We're just sort of getting a foundation so that um, the students have a good place to start from. And then when they see the more complicated material, they're ready for it. So that's one reason. Another reason is that learning mathematics and solving problems and writing proofs teaches um, our brains how to think in a certain way and it's something that we don't always get an opportunity to work on in uh, high school or elementary school so we are developing sort of like a mathematical creativity and a mathematical preciseness and that's part of it too so it's not strictly on the content it's also on the way of thinking so those are the re real main reasons for us uh, focusing on math so much in the first year. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, I see. Yeah, and um, you know, in the past I've talked to some of uh, my friends who are in the double degree program for stats and uh, business, and actually discrete math is not included in that program. And they've said actually they found troubles later on in some other courses that relates so much to, <laughs> to proofs and whatnot. Yeah, and it may not be the content so much. It may be just getting that opportunity to practice thinking in a mathematical way. Uh-huh, right. Okay, so this actually leads up uh, to our next question is, um, say I'm a very determined student and okay, I'm motivated to do well in A67. How will this course benefit me in the future? Maybe in terms of courses, well, specific courses. Sure. So uh -huh. in the immediate future, um, we find that students who work really hard in, in uh, MAT, A67, or CSC, um, tend to do better in the second calculus course they need to take. So we find that the practice writing proofs, the practice uh, being logical, the practice writing things precisely and clearly helps them do better in the calculus class, which is traditionally being a very challenging class. So that's the immediate, that's all in first year. Mm -hmm. um, and then after mm -hmm. that, most CS students will take uh, CSC B36 and B63. So B36 is theory of computation and B63 is introduction to data structures. And both of those courses rely on some of the material from 
A67. So there's the sort of the building block um, idea where mm -hmm. if you really work hard in A67, you're going to be a step ahead for those other classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got you. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, Let's uh, follow up. Thank you. Uh, so I guess one thing is uh, AC7 is obviously a very important course and because of that and the, I guess the mathematical precision, a lot of students find a little bit of trouble uh, breaking into that mindset. So what part of the course do you feel students kind of fall off in and start to get a bit more confused? Uh, and what do you have any tips for uh, those students when it comes to that kind of uh, that specific content? Sure. So the way the course is broken up is uh, the, the first half roughly is more based on principles that some students have seen in high school. So for example, uh, permutations, combinations, introductory probability. So that sort of feels like a review for some students. And I think because of that, perhaps they anticipate that the whole course will run that way. But in the mm -hmm. second half, we introduce logic and then proof techniques, and that's new for most students. So mm -hmm. the challenges that most students find that they are coasting along and then they don't really recognize that they need to up their game a little bit. So my recommendation is in the second half, really focus on staying on top of the material and don't let yourself get behind. If you find that you're struggling, then make use of all the resources you have at your disposal, which would be to either visit my office hours, which will be online this year, or your TA office hours, or your tutorials, make sure you make the effort to ask questions. Okay, so don't let yourself fall behind and don't be shy. Everyone struggles with content at some point and there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, yeah. And I'm just gonna follow up here with a very good follow up question. So uh, when I took A67, it was a, a bit different. It was uh, co-instructed by uh, right. Richard Panzer and yourself. And in that year, it was the proofs first and then counting after. So how come it's changed now? Yeah, so ideally, actually, when it was very first taught, we did counting first. And then due to logistical reasons, I needed to teach my half first. Oh, and so okay. the, proof, <laughs> the proofs came first, uh -huh. um, which isn't bad. It gives you more time for that material to settle. Um, before you hit calculus and it enables us to use some of those techniques when we're talking about the counting theorems. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. it can be kind of daunting uh, to start with the, the so-called more difficult content and then move into the easier content. So once, uh, when I, I end up teaching the whole class myself, um, I'm there for the full 12 weeks anyhow, so I flip the content back around. So I find that students are less intimidated, more willing to get into the flow of the course, more willing to participate if we start with counting, which is a little bit easier to get a grasp on. And then hopefully, um, by the time we hit six or seven weeks, everyone's feeling confident and they're into it and they're comfortable. And so the theory part, the, the proof part doesn't seem so difficult. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, yeah, there's definitely pros and cons to, to both sides of that. But, you know, especially with our interview with uh, Anya, actually, uh, we definitely agree that it's definitely a, better to make, you know, the first half uh, easier for people to transition into because, you know, yeah. there's so many people that come from different mm -hmm. backgrounds and whatnot. Sure. And it's uh -huh. a big transition coming to university. I mean, high school is very different than university. And uh, I think uh, it's good to have a, a few weeks there to settle in and not feel like you're immediately being inundated with really difficult concepts. Right. Yeah. And with that, you know, I think one message to first years here is that the proofs part is probably going to be quite difficult because a lot of people don't have experience with that. So yeah, yeah. be sure to get ready <laughs> for that part. <laughs> but don't be frightened. I mean, a lot of it, it comes down to uh, taking the time to put in the work and mm -hmm. practice. Exactly. And, yeah. and if you do that, you should be okay. For sure, yeah. I remember when I first started proofs uh, in ACC7, I didn't even know how to do true tables properly. And I was stressing. And then one month later, after a bunch of help from like the math office hours, and uh, I ended up understanding everything eventually. So yeah, for sure. I think students uh, should definitely not feel intimidated. And even though they don't understand something at first, they should definitely seek the help and take the time to learn it. For sure. Yeah. And actually, this past year, we switched to a more inverted classroom. And uh, 
I found that while some students didn't love it, a lot really did, and the marks as a whole went up. So I think my exams were actually possibly more difficult, and yet the student grades went up. So <laughs> my understanding is that students actually did better. So um, we're going to try to emulate that with the online version. Um, a little bit of an experiment, but uh -huh, we're hoping right. that it'll work out well. Sure. Right. Yeah, actually, uh, that was uh, going to be my next question down the road, actually. And uh, I think there's, uh, I guess, more of an important discussion here is like with this inverted style, I know the downtown people love to do this inverted lecture style, but uh, you know, for me at least, I don't see too much of how it can work online logistically because you know, it's supposed to be like, oh, you're supposed to be talking to the TAs slash talking to your classmates for help, right? Yeah. Uh, and reviewing the content beforehand is easy, but the talking part is um, probably a bit harder online. Yeah. So. Like I said, it is a bit of an experiment. And if mm -hmm. it's not going to work, if it's not working, we're going to have to make adjustments. And that's part of, you know, trying new things. Right. Exactly. Um, my plan is, though, to spend the first half of each lecture more traditionally. So reviewing mm -hmm. content, maybe working through some examples. Uh -huh. And then the second half, I'm going to take the class and, and uh, have breakout rooms of mm -hmm. roughly 10 students or so. And I've selected the students in such a way that they also all belong to the same tutorial mm -hmm. and the purpose of that is so that they get to know each other better and they're going to have a chance to see each other again in their tutorial and so in a breakout room students can unmute and talk their way through working on problems and i'll have a bunch of tas as well as myself able to jump into various breakout rooms and uh, answer questions as needed and hopefully that'll allow students to make new friends make study partners um, and work on some problems together in a, in a more dynamic way where they're actually getting, <laughs> you know, to talk to people. And right. um, sure. part of coming to university is making, you know, a new social network and a new study group. And I worry that if we don't do this sort of thing, um, that students won't have that opportunity as easily. And it can be quite lonely or even challenging academically. So I'm really hoping this works out. Um, I think it would be great if it can. If it's not, then we'll have to redesign a little bit along the way. But I'm hoping that uh, we can get it to work. Uh huh. Yeah, it's great that uh, you're doing the breakout room thing. Actually, that's probably one of the more innovative things that uh, I I've seen this year. So that's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, totally agree on the social networks thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've made a, you know a ton of my friends in first year, and really sucks how they don't uh, have the same experience this year. But it totally hey, does. I yeah. mean, <laughs> we're trying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's my goal is to try to make it. I, I want students to feel like they know someone that if they're having trouble, they can mm -hmm. ask a friend first. If they want some students to feel more comfortable doing that than talking to their prof or talking to their TAs. I want them to have those resources. And uh, I think it's really important to have, you know, a, 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 send, a set of friends who are in the same program as you, not necessarily just the friends you're coming to university from high school with mm -hmm. so hopefully it works uh -huh. fingers crossed right. <laughs> for sure for, yeah. sure for sure so uh i guess the next question i have is with the idea of experimentation with online learning uh what's one thing that you think uh online learning will open up that in-class lectures uh didn't really have the chance to kind of uh, explore well i mean one nice feature of online learning is that um Sometimes students don't make it to class because it's difficult to get there. For example, maybe they have to commute an hour each way. I know some students live far away. Uh, this way, you know, you can wake up at the last minute and quickly <laughs> join, join the class and you're there, right? And so at least you're not missing it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one added benefit. The second is we can record lectures and make them accessible after hours. So students who maybe struggled the first time through and didn't catch everything now have an opportunity to, to listen again without having to get it uh, webcasted. And um, it's not as good as being there in person, in my mm. opinion, but I think we can make it, uh, make it worth their while and um, hopefully make it an excellent um, learning experience regardless. Mm -hmm. Got you. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess one, one quick follow-up to that uh, you know, those are some very good pros. I know I would enjoy them a lot, especially uh, without the need to commute. Uh, but I guess like one con is 
you know, have you thought like, are you afraid maybe that people will get really lazy from this recording of lectures? Oh, I'll just watch them one day before the midterm <laughs> or something like that. Right. So uh, for sure, that is a potential problem. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some ways to fix that. For example, I could just post the lectures for a week. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, then you got to go and stay on top of it because it disappears. Um, not that that's trying to be mean, but it's more just to force people to stay on top of the material. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to have frequent quizzes, which will help students stay on top of the material. And I, I'm hoping to require students to have their video on during lectures. And there's a sense of accountability when people can see you. And uh, I know this from doing online uh, workout classes. If, if you have the video off, you're going to go at 80%. And if you've got an instructor there watching you and correcting you and telling you that you're doing things wrong or seeing you being lazy, mm -hmm. you're going to push a little harder. And it's the same thing. If you're, uh, you know, taking an online class and the instructor can see that your eyes are looking down or they're looking off to the side, then you know that they're not paying attention. And even though you're not going to call them out with 200 students, <laughs> the pressure's there. There is yeah. some accountability there that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully, hopefully students will be able to make use of this. The BB Collaborate software has like a little kind of like thumbs up, thumb down, like uh, different reactions that I know Anya has been using that for a different uh, lecture that she has, so that to at least gauge how students are doing throughout a course. So I'm sure you'll right. be integrating that too. Yeah. I'm going to use Zoom, but uh, I'll certainly be asking them for feedback. And it's pretty easy to just ask students, you know, give me a thumbs up, give me a thumbs down, you know, for sure. yeah. if it's uh, making sense or not. So definitely the feedback will be an important part. It's hard to gauge necessarily compared to in life, real person where you can see people's eyes mm -hmm. a little more clearly. For sure. So uh, I guess one question I have is uh, in the, idea of the nostalgia of in-class lectures uh, from the top of your mind, what's one uh, highlight, uh, one specific time that you remember in your lecture that something very interesting happened? I don't have any super fun uh, examples, you know, where, uh, I don't know, like a water balloon flight fight broke out <laughs> or something like that. But mm -hmm. I do have one memory, which was um, somewhat strange in that the very first day of class, for my first year course, I walked into the class and there was a student, first year student, writing on the board, acting as if they were teaching the class, oh. <laughs> which was really quite like, took me aback because they, they were explaining when my office hours are and when tutorials would start. And I walked in, I'm like, who are you? <laughs> I didn't think you were my TA. He's like, oh no, I'm just a student. I read your webpage and I thought I would just teach the class about what you're what you're going to be doing. It was a little bit awkward. Right. And were, um, you, were you late to that um, no, lecture? No, I or? was on time. Oh, okay. First class. Um, he just was there early and thought he would, you know, do a little teaching on the side for me. Um, so I actually was quite upset with him. But um, in hindsight, it's kind of funny. That <laughs> yeah. The first year student would have the confidence to go up in front of a hundred people and start talking about the course as if they were an instructor. Yeah, this, uh, that kind of reminds me of a, a video I saw. I'm not sure if you saw it. This, um, this group of students at a university decided to pull a prank on the professor. And so they made sure their professor was late to the first lecture for like five minutes or so. And they got this, uh, uh, this other older gentleman to go ahead and kind of go in the lecture, say some, you know, bad things like, I, you know, I don't want to see any laptops here. I don't want to see any phones here. Kind of really uh, make the environment kind of toxic. And then five minutes later, the professor walks in just like, who the hell are you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So that kind of reminds me of that. So it okay. was very similar. <laughs> yeah. I was just sort of taken aback, actually. Right. Really surprised. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, seeing as you have a TA meeting in about five minutes, that's actually all mm -hmm. the questions we have. And yeah, okay. we got through, through them pretty efficiently. And yeah, so thanks so much for joining us for this no interview today, Anna. Uh, Anna. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, I'll end the meeting now. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye.